So, hello. Well, good afternoon now, I guess. No, still good morning. <laughs> Uh, it's uh, an honor and a pleasure to be here and to present or uh, uh, just facilitate this conversation and be part of this panel to talk about large open source projects. Uh, and an interesting part, I think, is the, the, the types of projects we're going to be talking about. Um, my name is Gabriel Engel. I'm the, the CEO and founder of Rocket Chat, uh, a communication platform. And I think we have here large-scale projects that revolve about communication. I think nothing can get larger than a project that tries to get uh, people to communicate across different governments, different uh, uh, departments. So first, I think I would like each one of us to, you know, of you to introduce yourself, tell a little bit uh, what you're working on, why it's important, and why it's such a, a large-scale project for us to have the context. I can start with you. OK. Uh, let's see. Uh, so I'm Daniel Melin. I work as a strategist for the Swedish tax agency. And the part where, where this comes in is that, which we will delve into a little bit, is the project that's going on in the Swedish public sector where we try to move away in the collaboration space. We try to move away from locked-in solutions that is not customer friendly from a real customer perspective and not really legal for us to use and they don't supply sovereignty for for sweden as a nation so we try to move to solutions that uh, sort of is is workable for us in in all of these contexts all right, I just continue. Hi, great to be here. My name is Miriam Seifert. I'm head of political communications at the Open Source Business Alliance. That is a German business association. We have a little more than 200 members. And we work to spread awareness for, about the advantages of open source. We have a main focus on public sector projects and public procurement, but it's not the only thing we do, but it's one of our main focuses. Hi, good morning everyone. Uh, great to have still a few people here in the room. Uh, the others hopefully taking a bite over there. I'm Frank Blachetta. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer of Dataport, one of the largest government-owned uh, public IT providers in Germany, in northern part of Germany. And uh, the two topics that uh, I would like to draw attention upon is, of course, what we do with Phoenix, an open source uh, web-based collaboration suite where we put together some existing uh, um, standardized, highly used uh, open source components, put them together. And the other topic is, of course, what Daniel already touched upon, to really look up to how can we digitize government in a sovereign way, in a way where we really can determine by ourselves how to act in the digital space. Yeah, so one thing I think is, uh, we mentioned when we had this, our conversation to talk about, first, uh, you touched on the drivers for those projects. Uh, war, digital sovereignty, uh, the impact of the Digital Markets Act or making some of those things uh, uh, legal or, or illegal. What would you explore on this topic? Like, What are the drivers and when the project that we're currently working on started and, and why it got the, the scale and became a large project? Uh, it, it, it really started, so in the Swedish case, it really started in a, in a quite easy way and, and like two years ago, uh, where we looked into, you know, again, uh, tools for, for digital collaboration and a digital works, workplace for all our users and, and also, in some sense, there's a connection of, of citizens that needs to interact with the government. Um, and then we started to look in sort of, we had some solutions and we need to, some of them are, were dying. We can see a, a movement uh, that some of the larger software providers are going to the cloud and they are discouraging or dropping their on-premise solutions. So we are more and more forced to evaluate and see where we sort of have, where, where are we going? And we looked into these solutions, we found that most of the major solutions were, were not usable for us, as I said initially, for legal reasons and for suitable reasons, and, and again, for, for sovereignty reasons. So, and, and when we sort of open that can, we realize this is much, much more, and it's much larger things at play. And with the war in Ukraine coming, it, it fully exploded it, sort of within the government to look into, so, but hey, where are we going? Who owns our data? Where is our data? Oh, it's in the cloud, but that's not an answer. 
So we have to rethink where our data is, who has control of the data, could someone shut off our data? Could someone with sort of... We, we had a, a thing in, in 2019 where Donald Trump shut off Venezuela for, for, multiple server, for multiple American companies. And maybe that is not the case for, for European countries, but who knows? Sort of that, that idea took also a firm place in our thinking that we must be in control of the data. If you're a private company, it's another thing. But if you're the government, you have to be able to say to the citizens that we protect our, your data, we, we protect you as a citizen, we protect the country, and, and that, that must always be a, an overbearing thing to think about, sort of, uh, the, all the registers and, and things that the government holds, that the private sector never does. And how does that come into play? And, and going, coming from sort of, should we have this video conferencing solution or another one and ending up in this place two years later is a fascinating journey. But that's, where, that's what we did and that's where we're going. I would agree. I think that the situation in Germany is quite similar. Um, I think that the push for more open source in the public sector goes way back in Germany. Like the first larger scale project in Munich, that was 20 years ago. Um, but something that we find nowadays is that the concept of digital sovereignty actually helps us to, to open more hearts and minds and to, to gain more alliances. Uh, with people and uh, because open source for some people is a very abstract concept and it's hard to understand why it's important we keep explaining it every day but for some reason digital sovereignty as a as a buzzword kind of works even better and i think it has a lot to do with the war in ukraine because in my everyday work when i talk to politicians i find that i encounter a much deeper understanding about the need for digital sovereignty and digital independence and also for open source um, than we did before the war in Ukraine. So in front of that backdrop, I would say the opportunities, especially for large-scale public sector projects, have never been better. The situation was never better. Um, but I also always say that the glass is only half full. So the glass has never been fuller than today. It's the best we ever had, but it's still only half full. So a lot of work remains to be done. And in Germany, we actually started a bunch of really interesting projects last year. And the Phoenix project that Fredrik is going to be uh, deeper into later is only one of them. Um, another big project is the, the German government, OSPO. Uh, we call it the Center for Digital Sovereignty, and you can guess why. <laughs> um, so we just started that. Uh, there's a lot of work to be done. We also started our own government open source code repository, and also so the Sovereign Tech Fund only took up the work last year, and we're going to hear more about the Sovereign Tech Fund later on another panel. So there are a lot of really interesting projects in the vicinity of digital sovereignty, open source, and public government that only started now. Um, so we're on our way. Opportunities have never been better, but a lot of challenges ahead. Yeah, I mean, I, I would underline all of what have been said. Uh, as someone on the panel before and said verbally nodding, but I would like to, to add to the notion of the political shortcoming that we are looking at here. We are looking at a situation where we are only reacting. It is only reaction. There is no action. There is no uh, putting that together into one piece, into one vision, into one strategy from my point of view. And I think this is a misery. We have to talk about this, you know? We are looking at a situation where the three of us and many in this room are working upon singular activities to push something forward, to push some pieces into a direction. But we are not connecting that with the whole of government digitization, for example. So this is just singular activities we are doing. This is not the whole picture. And I think this is really something we have to talk about in the, in the upcoming situations. And also, that's why I welcome so much to talk about large-scale projects of open source in the public sector, because I think um, all the initiatives that have been done so far were great. And we have to continue that to take this as a complementary. But this is not enough. It's not enough what is happening at the moment in the political scenery. It is not on top of the agendas. It is still a lot of grassroots we are talking about, a lot of bottom-up thing. And it's not like on top of the political agenda at the moment. And this is something we really have to change because sovereignty, digital sovereignty uh, comprises of three areas if you look on it like a diagram. 
It comprises of, yes, data sovereignty, but that's something the sovereign cloud offerings, sovereign cloud offerings, will also offer to us. Don't worry about that. That will be somehow established. Yeah? Also, operational sovereignty, if you pay the price for it, will be established. The real trouble which we are getting into is technological sovereignty. I mean, we see a big tech war going on out there between the US region and the Chinese region. And we as Europeans are totally left behind at this moment. We cannot be happy only to have hyperscalers, engineering centers in the south of Germany or anywhere else uh, with thousands of people working there and be happy about that by itself. We have to uh, have our own competencies, our own capabilities, and for that we really need to take action now. If I may just add to that for a second, um, for sure. <laughs> Um, you're absolutely right. Um, there are a lot of people in German government who understand why it's important, but there are also a lot of people who have not yet understand or are pushing against it. And uh, even last night when we had a little event, uh, a lot of people came up to me from other European countries and said, oh, what you're doing in Germany, that is so great. That's the perfect blueprint. And I always want to say, yeah, it is, and it's a great blueprint, but it's not that everything is perfect in Germany. As I said, as I mentioned, we still have a lot of hearts and minds uh, to win, to win over, and every year we have to fight for the funding for the aforementioned projects. And there are huge, large-scale public sector projects coming up, like the, the government cloud that you also mentioned. German government promised that uh, when they are going to procure large government cloud solutions, that there will also be a main focus on, on an open source cloud. But this has not yet come to pass, and we have to push really hard to demand and to, to remind them of the oath to actually yeah, make it come to pass. So, yeah, it's still a struggle. The struggle is real. <laughs> just one comment, I love it. Um, I think nobody is against the way. It's just comfortable. It's just comfortable to take the Microsoft Sovereign Cloud or whichever solution comes to your mind because it, it, it really nurtures the situation of capabilities and maturity um, of public sector IT because they, they, they cannot really cope with having the right competencies to sometimes select, establish, deploy those kind of systems that we are talking about. So this is, I think, uh, it's n never against. It's rather a, a comfy thing. And sometimes also a distrust in your own organizations, which is also something that I think is a miss uh, of political leadership. I, I, I can add to that. I can see a, a lot of this sort of European way of thinking that we are behind. And since we are behind, we think then we must be behind. And then sort of it, it even goes further into, so we must buy foreign stuff because we are so behind. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy yeah, in a way. Yeah, and yeah. it gets worse. So as, uh, again, as, as I see, so the, the war in Ukraine is a real, it's a game changer in so many ways. And here we are looking at a, a tiny, tiny piece of the picture. Uh, but anyway, it, it does change in the way that, oh, sort of, it's, it's a bit of a wake up call, I would say, to sort of, but hey, where are we going? Who are we trusting with technology things? And, and what a lot of the open source people has been telling for 20 plus years is suddenly sort of, so that's what you've been talking about all the time? So, yeah. And sort of well, that's, that's where things are going. And, and it is, we sort of, but we've said this for a long time, that this is a solution. This is a way of going forward. And it's not protectionism or some kind of European insular way of thinking, because that would be bad. But it's that if open source is global, so why not tap into something that is global and build upon that? I mean, every new technology builds upon open source anyway, so why not be there? We don't have to do something European in, in any sense. I don't see that. But we shouldn't be fully reliant on, on American or Chinese, both hardware and software, we need to rethink the whole stack, the whole supply chain, and the whole way of how the European Union is sovereign or not. Because everything is data in the end. Everything is IT. We don't get tap, we don't get tap water, we don't get food, we don't get transportation. We don't get anything in, in a modern European country without working IT. And since working IT today is equal a lot of open source, it has to be there. And we have to be there. And we have to just see that that is the case and, and re rethink and maybe sort of stand up a bit, sort of st straight, straighten your back. That's a very good point. Um, and I think that you're right that it is 
in a way a self-fulfilling prophecy and as Frederick said um, there's a lot of people who are just too comfortable and we often in, in the administration we encounter this notion of oh we just need something that works quickly on a large scale and that's why we buy what is already there a proprietary solution and a lot of trust is needed to actually make that jump and to trust that an open source solution maybe not from such a large company, but maybe a joint venture conglomeration of different open source, uh, small and medium enterprises could work just as well and even better. But we have to straighten our backs and to infuse some trust uh, into the administration to actually make that jump. And I think that's, that's hard. Very interesting point. I think it's a nice uh, segue for what I, I wanted to talk about because uh, we're talking here, it's the requirements for data sovereignty, for uh, uh, they are not exactly, they're very tied to open source, but sometimes when we were uh, talking before, you say so open source is a way to deliver on those qualities, on those requirements, uh, but might not be the only way, or, or do we, how do we make uh, uh, or, or inform people on why open source might be the best way to deliver on those requirements? Uh, and are we talking beyond data sovereignty, open standards, open APIs, open protocols? Uh, there's a lot of things that go even far beyond just the code base if you want to have something to a large scale or widely used that is not just the open source. What, what, what is beyond open source that we should be talking about uh, for, for this to happen and become a reality? I, if, if I go first, I, I, I don't see the, that the government really has a role to push open source and, and be some kind of open source champion in society. Again, open source is just there. Open source, it, it combines a lot of good benefits, but it's the benefits that we are interested in, not open source in itself or open standards in itself. It's sort of what it gives us that is interesting for us as governments, as, at least for me. Uh, so, when we want things, we should be on a functional level, say these are the requirements that we have. To be able to serve our citizens, we need software that does this and this, or we need a cloud service that does this and this, whatever. But to be able to do that, the suppliers should realize, over, at least over time, that hey, if we're going to meet the, the government as a customer base, we need to move and the way to move is to more open because the requirements are, are heading in that direction. And I think that's sort of, it's, it's a bit of a roundabout way, but I, but I think sort of what we have done in the past is, has been that the, the government should say open source is great and you get some commissions and you get all kinds of groups of people who say nice things, but it really doesn't change much in reality by saying nice things. So I think the, the way to go is that the government is firm in its requirements and doesn't sort of back down just because someone says, oh, but this solution is much cheaper. Or there's a bunch of consultants who knows this solution. You will say, well, it doesn't matter. We need a solution that works this way. That is create and sovereignty for our nation, or it creates openness in society, or an open government, or whatever it is that we want. And that's sort of the, the goal, really. I think I slightly disagree um, <laughs> on one level. <laughs> Um, because I do think that the government should be an open source champion. Uh, and I think if I understood you correctly, you said that it's the suppliers who have to move. Um, but I think it's a two-way street. Of course, the suppliers have to move, but I think the uh, government has to, at the same time, also move into the direction of the suppliers. Because the government is one of the biggest buyers on the market. And if they say, we have these requirements for uh, digital sovereignty, and we have to make sure that the data of our citizens is protected, and that we are independent in the solutions that we use, in the administration, that we are not in a vendor lock-in, if they say these are the goals that we want to achieve, I think it's only logical and actually imperative that they invest into the open source industry ecosystem in Germany or Europe uh, as a whole uh, that is already there because only if they invest into the ecosystem and say like, okay, we want to mainly uh, procure open source solutions, uh, we, we make it a priority actually because this is a priority for us and our policies, um, then they will also strengthen the ecosystem and then the suppliers also feel a push to move into the direction of the government and their requirements. So I think it's a, it's a two-way street 
Um, and I think that our approach in Germany is uh, to actually have a little more push from the government side in order to enable the ecosystem uh, and the suppliers. The suppliers are there, um, but they also need to have the opportunity to actually sell their great open source solutions. So we have to, yeah, to have the, the, the conditions, the prerequisites for that. So, so for the mere joy of a crowd uh, uh, and, and having the excitement up, I would like to take some uh, uh, objections or some other standpoints at some, some ways. And we, we all know each other here very well, so everyone will be okay with that. I think that open, free, permissionless software is a golden standard for digital sovereignty. And there, there is no way, in, in my opinion, for various reasons, um, to, to not be the champion for open source and to be the front runner. Because if we look not only at the lock-in part, but I would like to add uh, some argument, also at the business model and investment part and how you develop those softwares, this is the exact uh, uh, example and, and really a showcase how all regions of this world could work together um, uh, in various ways in, on various artifacts um, to build the right software that is needed in the very end. So exactly what you said. And I really think, I mean, we, we had Log4j and others. We will talk around that also later on, on the artifacts and how it's used. But I really think that open core products um, being sold are, are a huge problem that we have to talk around also, maybe later on in another panel, because just using the artifacts in the communities uh, who are pushing with so much effort into those things and there's no proprietary software out there that has no open artifacts, let's face that. Yeah, that's, a, that's a total truth, I guess. Um, means in the very end, we have to make this a huge effort of societies, politics and the industry together to really make this a change and to really make also something possible which we call sovereignty for each of the regions and for each of the citizens from my point of view. Just to add one more thing, <laughs> sorry. Um, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're you're absolutely right. I think in the end, it all comes down to open standards and open protocols, as you mentioned before, Gabriel. Um, because I would always argue that open source is the better solution. But um, if we if we are honest with ourselves, uh, there will not be a point probably where the government is only using 100% uh, open source solutions. So the the important part is that the government is able to combine different solutions so that interoperability come on say it with me <laughs> interoperability um, is actually given um, so that we can actually combine the different solutions and I think this is something that we also have to push very hard so I think if I can summarize uh, <laughs> all the points which you find very interesting and, and obviously something close to heart for me uh, the government has the main role that we can all agree. It's actually pushing on those requirements, on what it needs to protect your citizens' data, to protect uh, its uh, continuity and operation. Uh, and, and you can maybe start with the open standards, interoperability. But if you go down and, and, and maybe you said you stop, uh, uh, stop a step further than saying, oh, it needs to be open source. But I guess if you boil down all the requirements, open source ends up being the solution or the answer. You just, you don't want to say it and maybe you want them to, to find out uh, or you think you might be able to, to actually just say like, we want something that is open so you can collaborate and see uh, uh, and participate and innovate together. Um, so that's actually this slightly difference from what you guys described. Uh, what brings me to, to ask you to tell a little bit more about the specifics of the projects that you are involved. Uh, getting into really the, the details because Germany and Sweden have a, uh, I might be <laughs> getting to a similar answer to the communication uh, uh, projects that you are involved, but have a very different strategy on how you've, you, 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 you reach that, uh, that I love you to describe. And, and I, I, I participated in a, on a meeting, that, the meeting that you, that you started, uh, um, and I'm just going to tell this part of the story because I think it was very, very interesting that he, uh, uh, Swedish government invited competitors from the open source market to be on the very same meeting all together. 
and some of the, uh, them are, 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 are here, like Frank and Matt and, and uh, Amandine. Uh, uh, and it was, we were all in the same meeting, and then we were like, what, what are we doing here? <laughs> in some way, it was, was a strange from a vendor being asking us all to be on the same meeting. And pretty much what you, uh, the, the government was saying is, look, we want this to exist. We want to have choice. We want those uh, projects uh, uh, to collaborate and make it happen that they can have a, a, a higher degree of favorability. Uh, can you make it happen? And then it, it was like an interesting role, which I think is different from what the, Germ the German government ended up doing. But I would love to understand from your perspective why you decided a route, what are the benefits, the risks, and uh, 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 I don't know, compare, compare notes on the two different approaches and the results. And I remember also saying that we want you all to be winners. <laughs> and, and I've never seen so many puzzled faces in a digital meeting before. <laughs> Because and someone you said, sir, so you're not pitting us against us, sir? No, 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 the opposite. We want you all to be winners, and that yes, it was interesting. It was and almost I, an open source thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but 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 the, the the thinking behind it is that if since we've realized that the absolute dominant market players were off off the off the chart for us to buy, we couldn't buy Google or we couldn't buy Microsoft or Zoom or Salesforce or any solution hosted by AWS. They were they were off because and they still are for multiple reasons. Still, they're still not legal for us to use. So so all of that and that takes away a huge chunk of the market. And then we realized, but it's, who's left? Uh, and there was a bunch of companies, of course, and companies or, or open source projects, there was a sort of different, different versions of it. And we realized that sort of if, if we are going to get the solutions we need, we need everyone who is sort of thinking like us or could help us or could provide technology to us. We need all of them to succeed and we need to make, them sh make sure that they don't compete on unnecessary things. Again, open source is a good thing but also open standards. So that's also why we push to say, there's multiple solutions of, of, doing, um, of doing chat. Chat is a very simple thing, but have you tried sort of, if you, your organization has one chat solution and another organization has another ch chat solution, do they work well together? No, that is not the case. So Slack has one thing, Teams is another, Zoom does it another way, Rocket Chat does it another way. And that was the market. And we said, this is stupid. I don't know what email solution you have, but we can email. I don't know what phone you have or what phone company you have, but we can talk. But that was not the case with chat. So that was a, a sort of the main goal, really, for that meeting. We say, start working together and start being interoperable so different parts of the government can have different technology solutions, but they can still work, work together in, in a good way with sort of full federation so I can see the status that you're not at work this day or I could just ping you or could just start an ad hoc chat with you and so forth. And, and, and we got also the questions, are, you know, well, how, how is that supposed to be done? And going back to our way of thinking is that we have no idea. We are not technology providers. We don't develop software. We are customer based and we're the government. So do you have a solution? And of course, the market has different solutions. And I say, pick one. Pick the one you think has the sort of the best path forward that seems to be easiest to implement for all of you. And if you can do that, you have a value. Because then you have the value of open standard built into your solution. And the dominant market players, they're not interested in that. So they will be left out. So then we will have a value proposition for us and to the market and say, we will buy these interoperable solutions. So if you're selling a non-interoperable solution, you will sort of, you will lose in the procurement phase directly on just on that point. And that meeting is one year ago, a little bit more than one year ago. And then it was nothing. Today, all the major chat solutions on the market have sort of in, in some sense uh, gone to the matrix protocol. So I think we had an impact, although we're just a few governmental agencies in a small country in Northern Europe, and that is the fun thing. And that sort of uh, spurred us to, we can do more of this, and we can, we can still push. And 
the way to do this is to be firm in your requirement specification and say, this is what we need. Please develop your, your software companies. You can develop things. It's just technology. The rest is business decisions that says, we don't want to do this, or we don't want to do that, or we want to go this path. It's, it's up to each company or each project to do whatever they like. But it's hard to develop and, and hard to sell unless the customer tells you what you want. So that's, again, that's really what we're just doing. So there's nothing you have said that sort of I, I'm against in any way. I, all, I totally agree with you in everything you said. Um, it's, again, it's like Gabriel yeah, put it, it's just we have sort of two ways of going to the same goal. Different paths, same goal. And I think both lead to the same goal. So what you said, I absolutely agree with too. It's the way to go. So go you. I think it could be a good blueprint for other European countries too. And we will look how go things go with you um, to see what we can learn from that. So uh, maybe just to add to that another example of, of uh, where we start. I think in the end we will be maybe in the same space, in the same area. We did a few things differently. Um, it started with backing of political leadership. We had a decision of the state of Schleswig-Holstein, the northern state in Germany, to uh, have an open source collaboration suite. That was the decision. And we are the public IT provider of Schleswig-Holstein, and we saw the same problems, which we had to react upon. <laughs> uh, and that's why we started Phoenix in the beginning. Uh, and we started from the user experience. And if I look at a classic public servant uh, who is working, uh, uh, he, he needs that kind of, of one look and feel in the beginning. Um, that's exactly w w where they are. And what we build around that, and that's the vision that we are working upon, is to have a kind of API around it where you can then, exactly like you said, interoperable, put in and out solutions. Maybe in a very vision, even just have a portal or something like that where you can just click and, and, and uh, add or just uh, take out some of the modules. So that's exactly where we are heading at the moment. And with this political leadership, it was a lot easier. The thing that we are doing differently is, we are not saying, there's a carrot, run. We're giving the uh, industry money. We're giving the industry money to develop those features that we want. And we have uh, uh, secured in the last years uh, uh, also a lot of federal uh, government money from the federal budget, which I think is of high importance for this, because this is a moonshot then. It makes you only a moonshot if you have the right funding, the right political backing, and when you can really move into that direction with this vision. I mean, we have seen so many projects in the digital space from governments which have failed. And they failed not fast, like you should uh, fail in digital projects, they faded out. It took years to come to understand that there will be no cloud Airbus coming up with Gaia X. It took years. Now we are there, yes, we have a very great data exchange platform and stuff like that, but coming from what the vision was of Gaia X, I think we are not there and we have not delivered on that vision from my point of view. And this is a perfect example of what we have to do in political leadership now. We have to make a vision, we have to bring ministers behind that, and we have to follow that vision through and really try to learn also on that. And if we fail, we fail fast. But what we do by that on the uh, diagram that I told you about, uh, operational data, uh, technological sovereignty, we save a chance on the technological sovereignty part because we save competencies and capabilities in Europe, in the industry. And I think this is the most important thing. And maybe one last thing, uh, and, and it's not uh, against you, Gary. I know you, you work differently. I mean, I was working for many years as a consultant and uh, designed go-to-market strategies for tech companies in various setups. Um, and I really have to admit um, that the open source industry is, is failing on many parts of how to tackle the public sector from my point of view. It is highly fragmented. It is... Um, uh, sometimes not complementary, but rather cannibalizing. Uh, each and everyone tries to add another feature in the value chain in their, in, their, in their thing, instead of focusing and really going into the vertical of one or two domains for yourself, and then work together. You know something? The public sector market is so huge, 
You can all smile. It's exactly like Daniel said. But you have to work together. You are missing one of the biggest opportunities. You all combined cannot take over what the market leaders are doing in the proprietary sector at the moment. That's why you have to collaborate on this. This is my speech that I'm giving to every open source uh, uh, tech guy and, uh, and girl. And I'd uh, 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 love to, to say that also out loud here. And I think it's very important that this message sits. Very true. In, in addition to that, you also mentioned this concept of the moonshot. Um, and I mentioned earlier that I think that the opportunities have never been better. But I also feel that with great opportunity comes great responsibility. <laughs> and um, I think that the pressure, especially for these large-scale public sector projects in Germany, the pressure is really high. It sometimes feels like we're in a football game and we're standing in front of the goalpost and now we have to score and the pressure, Extra time. The pressure is going up. And um, I feel that we really have to deliver with these projects because I fear that if they fail, if these moonshots fail, and we don't come together and the fragmented market does not push together to, to, towards the same common goal, um, people will not say, oh, it's just another failed government project, whatever. Honestly, I really fear that people will say, oh, it failed because it's open source. It was never going to work. And this is why I feel that the, the responsibility is really great and uh, the different uh, companies and industry sectors really have to come together to make it work to make it a success story so that we can push even further and so that next year we can talk with each other about uh, the new project that we started because the old ones are still going strong and are still very successful. So success really is imperative, I feel. And on that topic, because you talk about uh, yeah, how important the success of those large projects it is for the concept of open source and large scale projects itself. Uh, what do you think are the main risks and what we, we need to do or, or what the audience here needs to do for us to make sure that the, those projects are successful? Uh, I think you touched on the very first topic. It's more collaboration rather than competition. Uh, that for me, it's, it's a very, very import, important point. Uh, uh, I like to think that as a rocket chat, are trying to do ourselves in not reinventing the wheel, the wheel and trying to collaborate with other open source projects, adopting the matrix protocol, uh, uh, working with any other uh, project on what you can to not just compete, but try to, 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 to uh, uh, complete each other. But uh, uh, what else, I guess, on the government side, from funding or setting an example or, or maybe getting other countries from the EU to start similar projects? So, becomes even more of a critical mass of pushing this kind of innovation. Uh, what are the risks and what should we be doing to mitigate us and, and, and the audience? I think one more point that we have not yet touched on is the, the danger of open washing, I call it. Um, because we have to be really concise about what digital sovereignty really is and what we understand, uh, what we think it is. Um, because it's a concept that is very en vogue. Uh, uh, it's very in the time, but people really use it the way they want to use it, uh, the way it fits their concepts and their interests. Um, and I fear that especially big companies like Google or Microsoft um, will just adapt their marketing strategies and say, oh, all of our products are digital sovereign and it's all great and it's very much securing your digital independence. Um, and this is why it's very important to have a shared understanding uh, of what actually really constitutes open source and what is really digital sovereign, um, and to be yeah to straighten our backs and um, yeah and to not let them slip through with their claims of being digital sovereign when they're actually not. So I think this is something where we have to be very aware. And I mean uh, those companies that you're talking about. Um, I mean we just had and I won't disclose the name, we just had a company, a US company, um, who was doing an Outlook uh, 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 email to, we have 4,200 people at Dataport. Uh, we identified around about 500 people that this email has been sent to with a straight offering of, a, of a, an appointment to have together with them and to explain how sovereign their solution is and stuff like that. I mean, we shouldn't forget that's also playing to the let's play together and collaborate, you know, because our efforts or the efforts in this room are limited. The resources are limited. If everyone is running to everyone, 
<laughs> you will fail. Because they, the, the armadas that are over there are so huge, uh, and they are so well in argumenting, exactly like you mentioned, uh, we have to take a really high awareness of that from my point of view. I don't know much to add to that, but, but I, th I, think, yeah, but I think you already said yeah, it, you gave really the, in the, the beginning. The, no, but so the, 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 to realize that each open source project or each open source company has, to, I think that you, you all have to, you have to be a part of an ecosystem and you have to realize it is an ecosystem and you have to figure out where in the ecosystem do you want to be. And then you can be like the, the data ports way of doing sort of, we have APIs or we have boundaries between software packages that is defined so we can remove something and add something else that's a really good idea because that builds upon an ecosystem. Uh, and and in, we have seen that over time, sort of where, where projects grow and they're successful and they become more and more of all things to all people and probably won't succeed because there's seldom the funds to be all things to all people. So that was a, I think we all agree on that one uh, easily, that, that look, in, look deep into so your, your strategy on where do you want to be and where do you want to compete or where does your open source project fit in. And how do you, and build alliances with as many as possible, so no one else gets the idea to develop things that is already there, but just didn't know about it, or they thought that we can do this even better. And yeah, it may be so, but is it really necessary? Should you really focusing the development resources on rebuilding something that is already there and good enough? If it's of course, if it's non-working or bad by all means, but usually that's not the case if it's a, it's a project, project or something that is around and, and has a lot of users, it's usually good enough at least on what is per, sort of what's supposed to be doing. Um, I think we have about five minutes for some, some, some closing notes and, uh, and calls to action, right? Because uh, we already said collaborate, collaborate, uh, uh, more interoperability, Find your place on the ecosystem, not reinvent the wheel. I think this is, uh, it's a lot for the makers here, but what would be the call to actions or things that you would recommend for the other countries in European, what is from the government side, what, what can we, we should be asking them to do uh, to make sure that those projects are successful and then you can use them as blueprints uh, for other successful large scale projects, uh, not just on communication, in other EU nations or maybe I'm from Brazil, South America, like, or, 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 or US, or, or, or anywhere else. I think that the, the concept of blueprints is actually important. So that if one European company tries, uh, uh, one European country tries something out that looks somewhat successful, uh, that I think there's a lot of value for other European countries to just copy that concept and see how they can adapt it to their circumstances. Um, so we see a lot of uh, government OSPOs popping up right now, which is a great thing. And as I mentioned before, we started the, so the Sovereign Tech Fund last year in Germany. And I think just this week, the Open, Technolo the Open Technology Fund announced that they are starting a very similar project. Um, and I think it makes a lot of sense because the Sovereign Tech Fund is funding basic, critical open source infrastructure with German government money, which is a great thing, but a lot of countries, companies around the world are profiting off of that, and I think it has to be a joint effort. And another thing is that uh, for a lot of things that we have still on our agenda, projects that we would like to see to come to pass in Germany, we also look around what is going on in the other European countries. Um, is there a role model in Spain or in the Czech Republic or in Italy? And then it helps us actually in our argumentation when we talk to, to government officials and politicians that we can say, oh, look over there, they did a similar thing in Italy and it seems to work, uh, so we should try that out too. So it's always nice to not be the first one to, to break the mold, um, but to take a blueprint and, and adapt it to your own circumstances. So I think we should all look even more um, around to our neighbors and get inspired by them. And, and, also further the exchange just like we're doing it right now today here um, to take impulses and ideas and take them home and then adapt them. And, and to just add to that, sort of if, if you're from, from different countries or within governments, publish things openly 
we see. So we've had this, uh, as you say, we have these discussions, early, but someone else must have done this. Yeah. There must be a study on this, or a report on this, or development on this, or a requirement specification of that. But where are they, and how do you find them? And too many governments are too reluctant to just share these th simple things, so please do. And when you do, translate it into English. Yes, yes. Other, <laughs> otherwise, it will get nowhere. Uh, so, the, as I said again, we did sort of the, uh, uh, some research in the beginning on sort of where, where we're going. It was just in Swedish. Then we talked to some and they said, you need to translate it. So, we translated it into English. And then it blew up because then everyone around the world understood what we're saying and the issues. And Gabriel could read it or, or yes. Frederick could read it. And a lot of people, and we can also see the impact in the United States, and so sort of here's a Swedish governmental report, which, is, which just says things, but it set the wheels in motion, so it does work. And sort of just blast it out, put it on your website, on LinkedIn, Twitter, whatever, so sort of out with it. And don't, and, and to add to this, don't be afraid that it isn't perfect. Nothing is perfect. All software contains bugs all governmental reports or pre-studies or whatever also contains bugs. That is fine, but you have, but out with it. So others can read and build upon it and say, hey, in Spain they're doing this, or in Sweden they're doing this, or in Germany they're doing this. And we can build upon that and we can sort of point to that, sort of here's some other study or research or whatever. And, and doing the open source way but not software yes. yeah. and, and exactly. within government. Right. It's, full, yeah. it, it's so easy, costs nothing. Yes, so we have to put uh, air under each other wings. I think this is how I would summarize that. This is very important. We are all allies in this, so we have to push each other forward. You know, The reaction should not be, uh, oh, someone else is doing an open source collaboration suite. Oh, that's not, not a good thing. I can do it better. The reaction should be, wow, let's call them. Let's speak together. Exactly what, what we are doing, you know, uh, when I was in Stockholm, uh, I was at a conference where the whole day you all sp spoke in Swedish, there was, not a, there was not a missing, I learned a lot, uh, uh, um, but we had that exchange and this is important, we have to do that, we have to put that together and the glass is always half full, I have to say that as a Rheinländer, uh, the glass is always half full, you know, all of those initiatives bring us forward in those cases. And um, maybe I think all of on this panel uh, have the sensitivity, but I think it's very important. Um, we are nearing the, the first uh, year of a war going on in, in Europe, in the very near of us. Uh, so the last thing that I would just like to explicit, because we put that as a reasoning, all of us, uh, on this is uh, we stand with Ukraine. Thank you so much.